Hello, Mike. And good afternoon. Uh, the cute observers amongst you will notice that the light is a little bit different because our schedules are just a little bit different as regards the recording today. But welcome again to the latest episode of Broken Bread in which we're working our way through uh, the letter to Paul of Paul to the churches of Galatia. And we're in chapter 5, and we've spent quite a lot of time in chapter 5, because I think it's an important chapter for all sorts of reasons, not just because it gives us the instruction in the conflict between the desires of the Spirit and the desires of the flesh, but it also shows us, in a sense, the purpose of making that distinction so that we we know something. One of the problems of doing Bible study like this is always balancing what I call exegesis and exposition. That's to say, the difficulty sometimes of wanting to go deeper, but if you go too deep too frequently, just examining single words and things, you can very easily lose the theme. So I'm trying to balance things a little bit and give a more overview this afternoon. So exegesis, in my simple definition, really means digging deeper down to find the meaning of the words, the significance of them. And exposition really means how those words were applied to the first hearers, the first receivers of these letters. That brings us back to our familiar theme of context, context, context. I do recommend that if you don't do this, when you are trying to study a passage of Scripture, uh, you start, as it were, almost with a blank sheet and ask, first of all, some questions. Uh, who wrote this? To whom did he write this? Why did he write this? What was the occasion of it? For what purpose? What did he expect to be the conclusion or the goal of his letter? Uh, and those kind of things will help us to give a solid understanding of the book itself. There will be times when we can dig deeper and we can apply it personally to ourselves, and that's very important that we do that. But at the same time, it's important to see what this meant to the person who wrote it and to the people who received it, and then in our own context, applying that understanding and saying, as someone reminded me that I often used to say in the old days, so what? In other words, what am I supposed to do with this information? What is the application? Someone once said many years ago that exposition without application is no exposition. There's something for you to think about. Okay, so what are we going to do? Well, we're going to work our way through this passage here, and we're going to look at an overview in three sections. I'm going to look, first of all, at what I call the life manifested. And then we will move on to the second big section, which is the flesh manifested. And then thirdly, the spirit manifested, which I've kind of subtitled fragments that remain. So let's make a start, shall we? What do I mean about the life that was manifested? Well, if we look at the testimony of John the Baptist, he says this, I did not know him but that he should be revealed to Israel. Therefore, I came baptizing with water. So there, if you are mindful of these kind of ways, that is your vision statement. That's why John came as far as he was concerned, in order that another one might be revealed to Israel. And that word revealed is going to be significant for what I want to talk about this afternoon. So it really means manifested, something that shines out, something that is, it comes from the center. And it's one of John's favorite words. In fact, for a long time, it's one of my favorite words as well. I can remember that we had this little game we played sometimes with the church life students at Reading. And we would say, well, what is your favorite word? And they would always say, your favorite word is manifested. And I suppose that was significant because... We were keen that the things we were doing in the church life school was not just academic. We didn't want to just fill people's minds with highfalutin ideas. We wanted to ask, how is this thing going to be manifested in the sense of shining out? Because that's really the root of this word 
manifested, that's translated here, revealed to Israel and manifested in other parts of the scriptures. It's the Greek word phanereo, phanereo, which really means it's the picture almost of a torch procession and the illumination that's caused by the torch. The Greek word for torch is phane, and this is phanereo. In other words, it's what the torch does. It reveals things, it manifests, it shines and makes things clear. And we shall see the testimony and the significance of that in a little while. And John was very clear that his purpose was, if you like, to shine a light on the light. Uh, he was not that light, he said. He was very clear on that. He said, I am not that. Just, it's, this is what John, the, the uh, gospel writer, says. He, John the Baptist was not that light. He came to bear witness to the light. So having mentioned John the Apostle, let's take a look at him and see what he has to say. And for John, this word of manifestation is really one of his favorite words, you would say, looking from his writings. It's really used a lot and it's used in very significant ways. So it's important that we're not deceived. It's easy for people to listen to information. It's easy for eloquent speakers, persuasive people who can bring their apologetics and convince. But really, what we need is something more than that. We need something that shines out. One of the old holiness preachers used to say that the more people are brought to God by radiations than explanations. It's, it's a good saying. More people are brought to Christ by uh, radiations rather than explanations. And John would have agreed with that, absolutely. So let's have a look at John's gospel. This is what he says. This is how he begins it, if you remember. I'm going to emphasize the words light so you can see how this idea of light and the shining of the light is one of John's great themes. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overwhelm it. There was a man sent from God, whose name was John. This man came for a witness to bear witness of the light, that all through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which gives light to every man coming into the world. So John begins his whole gospel with this theme of life and the life radiating in light. And that's going to be kind of part of our thesis here for this afternoon. Let's go on a little bit farther in John's Gospel, chapter 1. This is it, the life. Sorry, this is 1 John. This is his first letter. The life was manifested. Can you see the connection between this here? In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And then writing later, in John's first letter, he writes, the life was manifested. He is our shining out word. The light, the life shone out. And we have seen and bear witness. He's adding his witness to John the Baptist's witness. And declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested. Same word again here to us. It's this great shining out. It's a wonderful thing that God has chosen to reveal himself. He's chosen to shine out so that who he is is radiated out so that it touches other things, other people, other creations that he has made. It's a wonderful, wonderful picture. I think it's significant that it was given to John to write this. He was the one, you remember, who leaned on the chest of the Lord Jesus at the Last Supper. And most people think that he was probably the youngest of the disciples, maybe in his late teens. He was certainly one who seems to have had a very, very close relationship with the Lord. 
He refers to himself in his gospel simply as the disciple whom Jesus loved. He doesn't even give you his name. He just says simply, the disciple whom Jesus loved. The life was manifested. You see, it wasn't just the things that Jesus taught. That was wonderful. It wasn't just the amazing miracles that were worked by him in the power of the Spirit. That was also wonderful. What really gripped John was the quality of the life of this man. And the way he expresses it is this. He says, well, uh, we've seen it. The life was manifested. We've seen it. I can still hear the excitement in his voice 2,000 years later. The life was manifested, and we've seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. You see, this man experienced something that he never recovered from, a revelation of the life of God in a human being, in Jesus Christ. In Christ, God was revealed. Let's go on a little bit more. This is also John's first letter. This is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If you know John's first letter, you'll know that this kind of extreme position, we might say, of John utterly refusing any kind of compromise with darkness is part of the ethos of the letter. It comes through it every time. The first chapter is very much about this. And if you do a study yourself sometime and think about the last writings that we have of Paul and Peter and Jude and John, you'll find there's a common theme. And it is that tribulation is coming, that dangers are coming, that temptations are coming, that there's going to be a falling away, that it'll almost happen now. Peter and Jude and Paul, of course, were writing maybe kind of 50 years earlier than John. And it seems that by the time John was writing these things, it had arrived. The time of declension, the time of backsliding, the time of uh, things not being at all in their pristine purity and power of the early days. And no doubt there were some people who, because they thought they had the words, they thought they had the thing. That's a quotation from A.W. Tozer, who used to decry what he called textualism. Because people have the word, they think they have the experience. Because we can get the doctrines right and express it properly, we think that is sufficient. But John would not have been satisfied with that, and neither would the Lord. It is, it's the radiations that matter. It's the way this life touches us and our response to it and God's purpose with this life that it should not just be alone. This is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Not, not the slightest shadow of a shadow. No darkness at all. If we say in them, John begins a series of if we says, and he's obviously taking the part of people who were, as we would say nowadays, well, they were talking the talk, but they weren't walking the walk. They were saying one thing, but they were living quite a different thing, and no doubt assuring themselves that all was well because they knew the language, because they'd had experience in the past, because they understood these things, and that was it, surely. Their doctrines were straight, pretty much. And John will have nothing of this. God is light, and in him there's no darkness at all. You'll see it in the book of the Revelation, too. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice. That's the word praxis in Greek, which actually means we do not live our life in the way of this is not our norm if if we walk if we are walking in darkness remember we said the last time that walking was often a depiction of the daily life the way it just kind of went on john says if we walk in darkness and we say we have fellowship with him and we're walking in darkness we lie 
and we're not living out the truth. We're not practicing the truth. Here's another one from 1 John, a little bit longer. 1 John chapter 3, verses 5 to 9. And he says this. This is a, not an easy passage of Scripture to get a hold of. And you know that he, that's Christ, of course, was manifested, we just read that he was manifested, to take away sins, our sins. And in him, there is no sin. Now, we could read this in two different ways. We could read it as though it was saying that in Jesus Christ, the person, there was no sin. That's to say he was absolutely sinless. And that would be absolutely true, of course. But there's another way that we can read this. And I think it goes better with the flow of this passage. If you know that he was manifested to take away sin, and in him there is no sin, do you, do you know that? Do you know that for those who are in Christ, there is no sin? There is, if, if John is using the language of Paul, there is nothing of that hereditary tendency to take us away in rebellion and independence from God. If you're in him, that's not there. Our old man was crucified with him so that the body of sin should be rendered absolutely powerless. Whoever abides in him, does not sin. Whoever sins has neither seen him nor known him. He's talking again about the practice of sin, about the pattern of sin. Anyone who continues in a pattern of sin, anyone who, if you want to use the language of Paul, anyone who is exercising the works of the flesh that we shall turn to shortly, anyone who is doing that has neither seen him nor known him. These are strong statements, aren't they? Little children, let no one deceive you. I was listening to someone preaching about deception on Sunday. Let no one deceive you. Again and again in the scriptures we're told not to be deceived. Let nobody deceive you. Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices, let's put the word in live, he whose daily pattern of life, he who practices righteousness is righteous. You see, Paul, he could never be, John, he could never be content with just saying, well, we're justified by faith and we're righteous in the eyes of God. That is absolutely true. But this is also absolutely true as well. And John insists on the reality of that spiritual truth. There is revelation which brings to us truth that we have been declared right. There also needs to be the realization of the life of God in the soul of men and women. Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. He who sins is of the devil. For the devil has sinned. It's really sins, continues to sin. The devil sins from the beginning. For this purpose, here we go again, telling you the purpose of Christ's presence, the Son of God was manifested that he might render powerless, that's that favorite word of Paul's, katargeo, that he might render powerless the works of the devil. Whosoever has been born of God does not sin. That's in the sense of does not continue in this sinful pattern of life. Does not live in the flesh in the light of those things. Whoever has been born of God does not sin for his seed, that's God's seed, remains in him and he cannot continue in sin. That tells you if someone does continue in sin, there is something radically wrong. Either they have slipped back badly, or they have apostatized, or for all their claims, they have never yet begun properly. For he who has been born of God does not continue in sin. These are categoric statements. For his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin, because he has been born of God. To continue to practice sin is incompatible with being in him, with having his life in us. The two cannot live side by side. 
Let's remind ourselves of how we got here from Galatians. The works of the flesh. The works of the flesh is really something from the inward that is being manifested in the outward. The outward now reveals the inward. And this is part of Paul's theme from Galatians chapter 5. That those people who manifest the works of the flesh are manifesting the works of the flesh because they are in the flesh. Because they are living a life which is independent of the guidance of God's Spirit. They're living a life which is centered upon self and self-realization. It's This is it. It's the inward reality manifested in the outward. It's the outward revealing the inward. These things, let me just remind us in case it's a long time since we read them. Galatians 5 and verse 16. I say then, says Paul, walk, live, if you like, continue your life in the Spirit. And you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Categoric statement. For the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary to one another, so that you may not do the things that you would. But if you're led by the spirit, you're not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident. This is why I wanted to come back to this word. This is the word manifest. It's the word manifest. The works of the flesh are the manifestations of another power that has not been tamed, not been brought to the cross, not been brought into that place of dis discipline and discipleship under the yoke of Jesus Christ. And those works of the flesh are evident. They are manifest. And this is what they are. So if people are continuing to live in a pattern of life which includes any of these items, it's because they're in the flesh or because they're in the natural man which has never responded to the things of God. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness. That's kind of sexual innuendo, amongst other things. Idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions. Are you a contentious person? Are you quick to start a quarrel? Are you quick to defend yourself? It's a work of the flesh. And you're not walking in the spirit. Jealousies, outbursts of wrath, do you have an uncontrollable temper? You're walking in the flesh, or you've never had it dealt with at all. Selfish ambitions. Paul, uh, John speaks about um, the lusts for glory that there are in the human race. It's a sobering thing to read the, the autobiographies of the so-called great men who wanted their name to live forever, and who lived their life just so that their lives would last for posterity. Ramses II, and, uh, Herod the Great, and the Caesars, and Geng, 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 Genghis Khan, as my Mongolian friends say, I should pronounce the name. Um, these people wanted their name to live forever. The famous poem by a man named Shelley. Who wrote about a man who thought he could make his name live forever? Ozymandias. Where do we get? Verse 20 then. Idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentious, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfless ambitions, dissension, heresies. I said this before, but the word heresy really speaks more about sectarianism than about doctrinal. Um, inconsistencies or inaccuracies. It, 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 a heretic was someone who gathered people to himself that he might lead them and convince them himself and become the center of their world. It's, it's easy to become that. It's easy to do that, to have some notion, some idea, and you become irrational. You become obsessed with something. 
and then, of course, you to try to persuade everybody else that you're right and to join your merry little band. Heresies, works of the flesh, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelsry, revelries. A night out with the lads, stag nights, and the like, and the like. See this? This isn't an exhaustive list. This is just illustrative. Of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice, there's that same idea of practicing, continue to live in this way. Those who live in such a way, who practice such things, will not inherit the kingdom of God. So there we are again with that word phaneros. It's clear, absolutely manifest. This is Young's live, um, literal translation. And manifest also are the works of the flesh, which are, and then you've got the list. So they are the outward expressions of an internal mindset. Their manifestation shows the true nature of the inward state. The evidence, link it with the word evident, the evidence is of an earlier crime, of something that still hasn't been put right. There it is, the works of the flesh are evident. We've just read that list, so we won't read it again. It is the mindset of self-realization and self-centeredness. It's, it's what Oswald Chambers calls, called demanding my right to myself. My body is my business. My life is my business. I'm the helmsman of this ship. I'll make my own decisions. That self-centeredness is at the very center of what went wrong right from the beginning. God put a man in the garden that was in Eden, and he gave him a twofold commission. It was to serve and to guard. Each one of those commissions is conspicuous in that it doesn't have the man's personal benefit and blessing at its center. The first one has the creation at its center. The second one also has the creation at its center in its defense against that force which would seek to destroy it. The thief only comes to steal and destroy and kill. So, Oswald Chambers called it demanding my right to myself. I want to kind of gather some fragments that remain. You remember that they gathered up the fragments that remained at the, the miracle of Jesus? so that nothing should be lost. And not that we've finished Galatians quite yet, but I, I want to go on a little bit. The opposite to the works of the flesh is the fruit of love. And love, of course, we made our own definition, didn't we? That agape is the love that chooses to seek not its own that always puts some other purpose as the target of its life and its purpose. The fruit of the Spirit is love. There's my semicolon. I persist <laughs> in using that. I'm absolutely sure that the fruit of the Spirit is love, singular, and that that love manifests itself. Yep, there's that word. Manifests itself in joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness. What a lovely list this is, particularly in comparison with the one that we've just read. The other one is all aggression and meanness and nastiness and hurt and pain and suffering. Listen to this list. This is the fruit of the Spirit. Joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk with purpose, we said last week, didn't we? in the spirit. 
So, in the works of the flesh and the fruit of the Spirit, we see an outworking of something that Jesus said so plainly in the days that he was on the earth. He says, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit. There you go. That's what John says, isn't it? That you cannot continue to bear bad fruit if you are grafted into the good tree. If that sap is flowing through your being, you cannot continue to bear bad fruit. It's not possible. Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down, and thrown into the fire. And then a little bit later on in Matthew, he says this. I think this is what Paul would have said to the Galatians and what John would have said to the people who read his letter. Also, either make the tree good and its fruit good, or else make the tree bad and its fruit bad. In other words, there's no middle ground here. This is either or territory. Either make the tree good and its fruit good, fruit good, or else make the tree bad and its fruit bad. For a tree is known, that's the Greek word recognized, a tree is recognized by his fruit, and your life may be recognized by what it brings forth, what it manifests. Does it manifest love? And this list of aspects of love, or does it manifest works of the flesh with all that horrible list that we read to it. It's evidence. If the works of the flesh are practiced, it is clear evidence that the flesh is at work. I just want to carry something forward here a little bit. It, it, to me, I, there's always I, I, my favorite reference, excuse me, stuttering you are here. My favorite reference to the works of the Spirit is often this one here in 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 6, verse 7, in fact. The manifestation of the Spirit. We nearly always call spiritual gifts, the charismata, we nearly always call those the gifts of the Spirit. See if you can find somewhere where the Bible calls it gifts of the Spirit. I like this one. The manifestations of the Spirit. Elsewhere in Hebrews, it's spoken of as the diversities of the Spirit. There are diversities of activities, but it's the same God who works all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit, gifts of the Spirit are manifestations not only of the power of the Spirit, but if they're genuine, they'll be manifestations of the character of the Spirit, who is love. And it's given to each one for the profit of all. Can you see again how that moves from the center to the perimeter? The manifestation of the Spirit, if you, are, if you like, the gift of the Spirit is not given to enhance your reputation amongst your little circle. It's not given to make you the leader or anything like that. It's given so that each one will profit. So it's Paul's little phrase again from Galatians, sorry, from Ephesians. And Colossians, when he speaks about the grace of God that was given to me for you. These are charis martyr. These are the grace gifts. They're given to you for somebody else. This is love that chooses not to seek its own. And I want to say now, in closing, just something about the fact that ministry and character cannot be separated. And this is really important, particularly with the power of the internet having revealed this trend to follow every wind of doctrine. And there is a biblical antidote. Let me show you what I mean. This is Paul writing to Timothy. He says, But you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them. I want to ask you, brothers and sisters, when you are listening 
to life on the internet, when you're listening to YouTube or whatever it is you're going to, do you know from whom you are learning them? Do you know who is saying these things? What do you, I'm, not, I'm not suggesting that you kind of go into one of these other websites, which is kind of finding fault with everybody. That is not what I'm suggesting at all. But what do you know about the character of these people? That People sometimes say, oh, well, they're doing good things and wonderful things are happening. Yeah, okay, it may be, maybe. But it's not only the fruit that matters in the things of God. It's the root. Where is the root? Is this coming from love? as part of the fruit of the Spirit? Or is this coming from what? The critical nature, sectarianism. Is this coming from want to destroy somebody else's reputation in order to enhance your own? Do you know from whom you have learned that? Do you know the character of the people who are saying these things? Let me show how that works out in the letter to the Hebrews. Um... They knew their teachers have gone back. They knew their teachers. They knew the character of their teachers. Paul often draws attention to the character and the integrity of the ministers of the new covenant. He'll commend somebody and he'll say, you know him or I know him and commended by the brethren. And this mitigates, this kind of puts into some kind of a balance the extremes of the translation committee of our King James I of England, King James VI of Scotland, who organized this committee to produce the King James Version of the Bible. And it has been a great blessing. And I, it's been my favorite. And I think if, when I retire from preaching, if that day ever comes, I shall just go back to my King James Version. Um, but this Stuart obsession, he was part of the Stuart dynasty, King James. They had an obsession with rank and position. And most modern versions have corrected this Stuart hierarchy translation. And they opt for more accurate. They speak about your leader or those leading you. This is not obedience to a hierarchy or to an office, which is what the Stuart dynasty insisted on, but an admonition to be mindful of those leading you. The true spiritual authority in the early church was based on an ongoing relationship, not on positions on an organization chart. Let me illustrate it. Oh, there's a lot of these. Hebrews 13, verse 7. Remember them which have the rule over you. This is the old King James. This is the version that um, King James I endorsed. He loved this. Remember them which have the rule over you. That's it. He believed in the divine right of kings. There are sprinkles of deity about me, he said. Yes. The New King James Version sadly has followed this unquestionably. And they have remember those who rule over you, who have spoken the word of God to you. It goes on to say these different things. This, I'm dabbling a little bit in other translations. This is the, the old Holman's Christian Standard Bible. It's now just known as the Christian Standard Bible. Remember your leaders who have spoken to you God's word to you as you carefully observe the outcome of their lives. That's That's a Get moving on to a kind of a, a paraphrase more than an inter, uh, translation. But look at this. You observe the outcome of the lives. You remember the people that you follow in leadership, the people that you trust in leadership, are the people who you can trust because their lives are evident of where they're walking, whether they're walking in the spirit or whether it's part of the works of the flesh. Ministry and character cannot be untangled they are interwoven together here's another one this is from young's translation the same verse actually be mindful of those leading you that's even better because leader might be kind of a title that you give to somebody but this is just a function be mindful of those leading you and that's what the greek says <laughs> uh, who did speak to you the word of god whose faith considering the issue of their behavior be imitating isn't this a wonderful thing he doesn't say um he doesn't say trying to imitate their acts he says well imitate their faith but be sure you're imitating the faith of people whose be behavior 
endorses the things that they're saying. There's an old story of a preacher whose congregation used to say that he was such a mixed character that when he was in the pulpit, he preached like an angel and people thought he should never come out of it. But as far as his wife concerned, he was like a devil and she thought he should never go into it. That may be an extreme case, but there are other cases that wouldn't be quite so extreme. Considering the issue of their behavior, how do they live? How do they live? Here's Hebrews chapter 13. This is again the King James Version. Here comes this word, obey. Them that have the rule over you. Oh, King James must have loved that. He rubbed his hands together and chuckled. <laughs> obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls as they must, that, that must give account, that they may do it with joy, not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. And the King James Version, the New King James Version, isn't a great deal better. Obey those who rule over you and be submissive, for they watch out for your souls as those who must give an account. Let them do so with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. But how about this? This is the New International Version, which is more in the way of a paraphrase, but I think they have captured this beautifully. <laughs> because that word that King James's translator has translated as obey really is better translated as trust. And the NIV has got it. Have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority because they keep watch over you as those who must give an account. Do this so that their work will be a joy and not a burden. For that would be of no benefit to you. You get glimpses, you know, when you read these last verses of many of the epistles of the relationship that existed in these little churches in the first days of the Christian era. Uh, these people who lived their lives, their little churches in every house, who served God and loved one another, who gained a reputation even amongst the heathen, who said of them, see how these Christians love one another. Be sure, brothers and sisters, that you walk in the Spirit that you give God the opportunity to manifest fruit that brings glory to him. For he's chosen you. You've not chosen yourself. He has chosen you. That you should go and that you should bring forth fruit that abide for the glory of God. God willing, see you Thursday next week for another episode. Thank you for being with us tonight. God bless you.